Appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm Mike, this is my wife Cheryl, and uh, what we're going to do today is we're actually going to be speaking on uh, what's happening to boys and girls. Uh, and so I'm going to take, here's the thing, both Cheryl and I are fighting for every second because we are never for a loss of words when it comes to speaking, right? So what we're going to try and do is do 35 minutes each, one for boys, uh, the threats that are facing boys, and then one for girls. And then we're going to leave time uh, at the end to do Q&A because the truth of the matter is the threats that are happening to boys and girls right now are actually unprecedented. My parents have no clue what I'm talking about. I didn't face any of these threats, and there's probably no parent in this room that has faced the threats we're about to talk about. <clears throat> so this is new information, uh, and for us to parent well, we really need to know how is culture, how are environmental factors, and how are new ways of just thinking about life, how is it affecting our kids? And so the way it's impacting, there is some overlap for the boys and the girls, but in some cases, the threats that are threatening boys have the exact opposite effect on girls. And so we're gonna try and do the very best that we can uh, to give you guys a high level overview and then some really practical, simple things you can implement. And I just wanna say, I am really glad that you're here. Uh, George Barna, who's the legendary Christian pollster says that only about 3% of Christian parents think they're doing a really good job parenting. So parenting is not easy. And so the people that are intentional about it and people that come to a conference like this are probably have a higher percentage than that. But I want you to know there is nothing probably that we're gonna say today that Cheryl and I have not either done. Um, well, I'll just leave it at that. There's, I don't think there's anything that we say in any parenting stuff that we didn't do. And we actually write our entire parenting seminar. We have 10 hours of spoken material. Almost all of that is based on mistakes that we made. So if the, do, do not think that we we're up here to tell you that we had it all figured out. We didn't. We didn't have it all figured out. We made a ton of mistakes and we just says, well, let's share it and maybe somebody won't have to make all the mistakes we did. So that's our heart behind this. So we are short on time, so let's go. So we're, I'm gonna start with the boys. Uh, and this talk is called uh, Boys in Crisis. Uh, it is a PG level talk. I'm gonna be talking about reproductive um, terminology. Uh, I just let you know there, I don't see any kids in here, but it will raise questions, or it could. Uh, and I'm going to talk about five things where boys are failing, because boys are failing across the board. First, uh, life expectancy. <clears throat> Men live about five years less. They're twice as likely nowadays uh, to be addicted to drugs. Um, and suicide is through the roof. Since 1970, um, suicide, no, since 1990, suicide is up 77%. And just to give you an idea of scope, in the United Kingdoms in the year 2015, in one year, more men committed suicide than all of the men who died in battle since 1945. Every war since 1945 has killed less men than the men who killed themselves in a single year. And it's mostly white males, uh, and it is mostly middle-aged men. <clears throat> and education boys are failing. Uh, they drop out at higher rates. They're enrolling in college by the millions less each year, and almost all law degrees, medical degrees, masters, doctoral theses, these are now women. This is brand new. This has never happened before. When it comes to real world wages, a man with a high school education only has dropped in his real world earnings about 20%, but women have got an increase in pay. When it comes to women, everybody's heard that, that stat that um, women make 70 cents on the dollar, right? To what men made, have you guys heard that? That was a single study, and this is what they did. They counted all the men and averaged out what they made, and then they counted every woman in the United States and says this is what they made. And what they didn't account for, women who wanted to stay home on purpose, women who work part-time jobs, or women who work flexible jobs so that they could be mothers. And so it was a terrible study. In real world, if you look at a graphic designer in Atlanta uh, who is mid-level, women are making anywhere from eight 
to 17% more than their male counterparts. And I worked for Lockheed Martin for about 12 years. Almost all of my managers were female. They made more money than me, almost all of them. <clears throat> In marriage and family, uh, men are also failing. What's happening is failure to launch. That means a guy who goes to college and then comes back and lives with his parents in the basement, right? That is mostly men. F home ownership for women is twice as high as it is for men. Uh, and for the first time ever, there are more female drivers than male drivers. That's never happened before. When it comes to health, obesity, of course, is a problem, but it's leveled off for women at 59%. For men, it's now up to 70 and probably higher, and it's still climbing. So men are getting unhealthy, and the two things that are truly troubling <clears throat> are these. Sperm counts in men are down 60% since 1970. That means that men today are less fertile than their parents, just their dad. And testosterone has gone down 1% per year since 1987. And so what you have is men who are becoming less manly physiologically. And the problem with low testosterone, remember how I talked about weight gain? Testosterone, low testosterone causes men to gain weight. Well, low testosterone causes men to lose cognitive ability and women are now outperforming men on IQ tests for the first time. Low testosterone leads to lethargy. And so you have men who are getting outperformed at work and gaining weight. And depression is a key factor in low testosterone, and depression is tied to suicide. So we have environmental factors for men and for our boys that are having a profound impact, not just psychologically, but physiologically. And it's not a US problem, it's global. Every single first world country on the entire planet is seeing the exact same thing. It's all measurable, it's all reproducible, and there's data for all of it. So think of France, Germany, Brazil, Spain, every place that you consider first world country, they're all seeing this in men. And you know what's happening? Nothing. It's not being studied. It's unprecedented. Think about this. You have half of the men in the first world countries who are having profound physiological problems becoming less male all the time and there's no coverage of it. Has anybody heard these stats? Nobody. It's not getting covered in the media and as of whenever I wrote this talk, I think uh, a year and a half ago, there wasn't a single NIH study trying to look into what's going on with men. Though it's a global phenomenon, nobody is studying it. But when I read through the list of stuff the NIH was studying, some of it was so inane and some of it was so gross, I can't tell you in this setting. It's embarrassing, I can't tell you what they're studying. They're paying millions of dollars to study stuff that is not important, and this is very important, no studies. And so the question is why? Well, there's a perfect wave, a tsunami, that's affecting our young men right now. First one is affluence. Women do not need to be married because they're making more than their male counterparts. Second, there's no stigma for divorce. And so they can separate and go on their own. And they almost always get the kids, which leaves the man isolated, uh, lonely and depressed. Okay? Third, we've moved from a muscle economy to a mental economy, and that is changing exponentially. And a lot of our boys, not a, not a ton, but there is a fair portion of our boys that are probably not wanting to go to school my youngest son probably will not go to college. Now he might, but it won't surprise me at all if he doesn't because he likes working with his hands. He loves getting muddy and dirty and bloody, right? That's what he likes. Don't need a college education for that. Uh, and then the last thing, toxic masculinity, that could be an entire talk. But we are now, I think one of the reasons there's no coverage is that there is a genuine consensus in the media that men becoming less men, manly, is a good thing because they're seeing manliness as a problem. But I think Candace Owens said this, if you heard this quote, she says, we don't need men who are less manly. What we need is men who are better men. And I agree with that entirely. But we have a perfect way of facing our boys of stuff that's trying to strip them of their uh, masculinity by teaching and then we have environmental factors that are causing it physically. This is what we're facing. So this is three books we use to prepare this talk. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, talk to me afterwards.
<clears throat> I'm going to spend a lot of time in education uh, and the first four areas that I go to. And so we're going to pick up speed as we go. OK, but on education, I want to camp on this one. This is shocking to me. The number of kids who say I don't like school is up 71 uh, percent in 1980s. But that's only boys. Girls don't, aren't seeing this at all. Boys are saying I don't like school. Well, that's not real good for your earnings potential, is it? It's also not real good for mating's potential because in the 1930s, education was ranked 11th by women in terms of what is an attractive spouse look like. It's now ranked fourth and it's probably soon going to be third. But guys aren't excelling in school, so it even makes them less dateable. So what's happening, there's three factors that's going on in education and has become vogue for principals and for school districts to brag about having a rigorous kindergarten education or kindergarten program. And what that means is reading. So when they say rigorous kindergarten, they're talking about emphasizing reading. And the U.S. has dropped to 24th in reading and we're way worse in math. But we dropped to 24th. And so what the U.S. is trying to do to overcome this is we're starting the kids earlier. Seems like a good idea, but there's a problem. Boys' brains and girls' brains develop in a different sequence. They all catch up around seven years old, but from three, four, five, and six, girls have a huge advantage. There's a thing called parietal gray matter. That is in charge of character recognition, phonics, everything that helps you read. And girls, that part of their brain explodes from three, four, and five. So at five, a lot of girls are ready. Boys have the same explosion, but it's temporal gray matter. And that's the kicking, running, and acting like a superhero part, right? And when you look at a five-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl, and you watch them try and play kickball, there is a visible difference, right? There is a difference in the way their brains have developed. But the boys, their brain is not good yet at recognizing characters and attaching sounds and learning numbers. And the girls are fully ready for it. So this is what happens. Intensive reading drills that now characterize early elementary education may actually lead many students to disengage, particularly boys. And I'll skip to the last line. It says, what they need is to develop a love of reading. And if you're constantly failing at something, do you love it? No, you don't. And so this is what's going on. <clears throat> In early education, um, when you're starting reading at five years old in kindergarten and first grade, what happens is the class gets separated into two groups. And you have the, the kids who aren't ready, they're over in this group and they're playing with toys and trucks mostly. Uh, and then it's mostly the girls and the teacher and a couple of boys and they get special reading time. So they get special reading time with the teacher, special kudos from the teacher, and they're getting to learn stuff that the other kids aren't doing. And the boys who are five and six don't understand about parietal gray matter. What they understand is that they're in the dumb group. And boys do not like to be in the dumb group. Girls don't like it either, but boys really don't like being in the dumb group because by nature they're competitive. And so they're failing and they fail across the board. And that's why I don't like school is up 71%. Part of the reason. There's another one. There does seem to be an anti-boy bias, and so this is controversial. There are a lot of studies. I'm just going to cite this one. Uh, this is from gender disparities in test scores and teacher assessments, evidence from primary school. And this is what happens. Boys who perform equally as well as girls on reading, math, and science tests are graded less favorably by the teachers, except in one condition. And this is where the boys get the same grade. It's when the boys sit still, don't cut up, don't ask to go to the bathroom, don't wiggle, don't play with a fidget spinner, and don't make a bunch of jokes. So when the boys behave physically like girls, they're graded the same. But if the boy gets the same technical grade, he gets graded lower. And Cheryl and I have a homeschooling co-op, and we're teaching 15, 14, and 15-year-olds. And it's a mixed class. And I'll tell you, if I wanted an easy life, I would get rid of all the boys. And I would teach just girls. They're way easier to teach. I was an elementary school teacher. I've taught 3,000 children. And if I wanted an easy life, I would teach at a girl's school. Because boys are much more challenging to teach. But they still need to be taught. 
right? And so we're seeing a bias. And I'm not saying it's intentional. I think some cases it is, but in general, I think it's not. It's just, it is harder to teach boys because they're so wiggly, right? And teachers want to teach. They want kids who are riveted watching them, right? And boys, when they're listening, oftentimes aren't looking at you at all. And the more they're wiggling, the more they're listening. But it's so disconcerting for the teacher. So that's the first part. Video games, I'm not going to mention about because we're going to be doing a four-week parenting deep dive uh, after this, starting next Sunday. We're going to talk about video games and especially what's going on in the brain. Your kids do not, in general, have willpower problems. Uh, these games are engineered to overcome all of their psychological abilities to resist, right? There is a physical thing that's going on in their brain. We're going to talk about that a lot. So I'm going to lightly touch on video games and we'll hit it real hard. What do you actually do that's practical and simple? But here's the thing. Nietzsche, and I don't know, I don't know what you think about Nietzsche, but he really well identified a, a thing about boys. It's called the will to power. And it's the idea that they're in control of their environments, that they're masters of their destiny, okay? And there was a PlayStation commercial, I don't know if you saw this, and it says greatness awaits at the end of it. And when I saw it, I thought it was the dumbest thing I had ever seen in my life. And I can't play it, I brought it. But this is how it starts. It starts off with a guy in a car and he's just sitting there in the first line. Who are you not to be great? You, the child of God's. You, the kid, are you the child who has the power to give life and to rescind it, to change history unaffected by time, unaffected by boundaries, who are you to be denied? And if you deny your greatness, you deny it to the world, and we will not be denied. <laughs> and when I saw that, I'm like, that is so comically narcissistic. <laughs> I've never heard, the, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. But then he says this, he walks past, he puts on these battle gloves, and he starts beating back these robots, and he dives into this. And it hit me years later, I'm like, this is brilliant. It isn't stupid. This is the heart of every boy. To go in and wage battle and to just punch a dragon in the face, right? That's what boys want to do. And PlayStation tagged into it. And so I saw this article last week, Why Greatness Awaits Still Inspires After Four Years. This is going to inspire in 400 years because men have not changed since Adam. It's their nature. And so as a parent, if your kid, especially your boy, is really struggling with video games, you have got to give them something where they can truly test their mettle because they're doing it in a virtual world. What they want to do it is in a real world. Super important. So we'll talk about technical stuff about game addiction later, but a couple of things. It does cause attention deficit. It does encourage risk taking. It does encourage obesity, not because they're sitting around, but the massive dopamine stimulation that they get um, increases your appetite. So they're sitting there. The only exercise they're getting is this, but their appetite is going through the roof as if they've just played like a, a done a t double session for football practice, right? Uh, it causes problems and it's dehumanizing. If you shoot somebody in the face with a shotgun 10,000 times, it becomes kind of not normal. It becomes normal. Right? There's psychological stuff going on. And so young people who play violent video games change their brains. That's from Experimental Psychology Today in an article, Chronic Violent Video Game Exposure and Desensitization to Violence. And this one's even more um, alarming. This is from Aggressive Behavior. And the title of this, Effects of Realism on Extended Violent and Nonviolent Video Game on Aggressive Thoughts feelings and physiological arousal. It's a physical thing. It's happening psychologically and physiologically. And it says this, the more realistic, the greater the effect. And video games now are tremendously realistic. So when you shoot somebody in one of those games, it looks like you shot somebody. It really does. It's very, very realistic. Um, so if you want to make it simple, you have to think about video games as donuts for dinner. Would you allow donuts for dinner once in a year? Yeah, my mom used to make homemade donuts and we would gorge on donuts and we were stuffed so we didn't eat dinner, right? But we didn't do that every day. And if you gave your kids donuts, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you gave them as many donuts as they wanted all the time, and gummy bears and Doritos, 
pretty soon CPS is going to show up at your house. It's child abuse, right? So this is how we think of video games. A little bit's OK. Not a lot. So dads, I'm going to talk a lot about dads uh, in, in the Sunday school class. Um, but I want to tell you about a thing that's called telomeres. Telomeres are part of DNA, and it helps in cell reproduction. And you can look at the length of a telomere in people, and you can predict how long they're going to live. The longer the telomeres, the longer they're going to live, because it aids. And eventually, they get smaller and smaller as you get older. And with boys, when dads are gone, it decreases telomere length just being fatherless. But for boys, the impact is 40% greater than for girls. So a fatherless home with boys is, that is an even more serious problem. Dads are incredibly important. Uh, and I only gonna hit one of these because I'm gonna run out of time. If you take 1% loss in a city of fathers, you're gonna get a 3% increase in crime, violent crime. So if you have a city that has 50% fatherlessness or an area of a city, you're going to have an increase in 150% of violent crime. And if you have 70, now you're looking at 210% increase in violent crime. Dads increase IQ, they lower aggressive behavior, they lower psychological referrals for counseling. Dads are incredibly important. Um, and uh, I'm gonna talk about teasing. And th this is a list, this is my favorite part of all the talks I do. This is what dads do intrinsically that's so awesome for their kids. But I can't do that now, it's a teaser, so. All right, so you had Princeton, Cornell, and UC Berkeley, and they asked a simple question. Is fatherlessness what is causing the problem in all of these cities where there's such rampant crime? Is it fatherlessness or is it other cause? And this was their conclusion. The study confirmed that father absence is not correlated with negative outcomes. It causes them. So dads, your return on investment into your kids is through the roof through the roof. A small effort on your part gives you way bigger gains than you deserve. It's an awesome thing to know as a dad, right? It's like, wow, I can give in a little bit of this and I get a lot of return on it. So it's, it's, it's an awesome thing. I want to talk a little bit about ADHD because ADHD diagnosis in the U.S. is up 1,000% since 1979. So you tell me, in the last 40 years, you think the kids who really have ADHD in 40 years has gone up 1,000%. No, it has not. What's happening is that Johnny, who's six, is having trouble sitting still for seven hours. So he gets a referral to the school nurse. The school nurse says, oh, maybe Johnny's got ADHD, and they tell the parents. So the parents go to the pediatrician. The pediatrician doesn't have any tools, diagnostic training, and no training in actually diagnosing ADHD, but he says this. He goes, well, let's give him some Ritalin and we'll see what it does, okay? You know what it does? It makes your kid calmer all the time for all kids. Every single kid who's gonna take a, um, Ritalin or Adderall or whatever it is, they're gonna improve in school because they're gonna have better concentration and they're gonna be more calm. So it begs the question, why don't we just put all kids on Ritalin? Doesn't make sense? Because if you were on Ritalin, your concentration would go up too. Here's the reason why not. In your brain, in the, uh, um, the, that central section, the blue section is called the nucleus accumbens. It's a part of the brain that's uh, in charge of motivation. Your desire to better yourself. All of these drugs, um, the, the stimulants stimulate or simulate dopamine, and it's a massive hit of dopamine. And what's happening is the dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens, what it appears is going on is that they're getting damaged because the longer a kid is on these Ritalin and the higher the doses, the more the effect seems to be that what happens is, uh, I'll read it from the top. When juvenile laboratory animals were giving stimulant medication, like Adderall, uh, those animals displayed a loss of drive when they grew up. They looked normal, but they didn't want to work hard for anything, not even to escape a bad situation. And the conclusion was, the study suggested that children may look fine while they're on the medication, but when they stop, they don't have much drive. 
we're seeing boys and men. Most of the ADHD referrals are boys. It's up a thousand percent. So all this stuff kind of ties together, right? Is one thing the cause? No, it's like a, it's a perfect storm from all different things. So there's different types. This is on your handout and I'll discuss this in a little bit. And there's another one, environmental. I, I don't know what to title this slide because it's technically environmental estrogens, right? But it's also um, endocrine disruptors. And really you could just call it plastics. But here's what's going on with them. Here's a quick story. In Puerto Rico, what they found out was that girls were becoming fully ready for childbearing at 10. That's way too early. So in the 80s in Puerto Rico, like we have got fully functioning female 10 year olds who are ready for reproduction. What's going on here? This is not right. Because they knew there was a group of girls in Philadelphia that were Puerto Rican and they weren't seeing that problem. In Philadelphia, the girls were hitting puberty around 12, 13, 14, 15, like normal. They go, well, there's got to be something. So they checked steroids and meat. They did hormone testing. There's all this stuff. And they finally found out that it was a thing called PET, phthalates. And it's a chemical that's leached out of plastic. And in Puerto Rico, all their food and most of their drinks were coming out of these plastic bottles and it was leaching this chemical into the girls' bodies. And when they checked the Puerto Rican girls, their phthalates were through the roof. And when they checked the girls in Philadelphia, the Puerto Ricans, their phthalates were low. And their physical reproduction was on a normal track. And so Costa Rica actually did something. I mean, Puerto Rico actually did something about it. We are now seeing this in the United States, early onset puberty for girls here and what they've said is, well, uh, that's normal. So we're not looking at the problem. We're just saying, well, that's the new normal to have girls hitting puberty at 12 or 11 or 10. So that's your tax dollars going for you. Um, BPA, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this for lack of time, but uh, you can find bottles that say BPA free. This is another thing that leaches out of plastic. And if you, if you ever left a water bottle in your car and you open it, you smell it and it smells plasticky, don't drink it. <laughs> Guys, don't drink it. It's estrogen, right? It makes you more female. Don't drink that, right? You can smell it. And you can also now see stuff, plastic bottles that say BPA free. That's good. Um, so BPA, here's what's interesting about it. It makes people get fatter. Now, not boys and girls, it makes cats fatter. The cats today are fatter than they used to be, and the rats today are fatter than they used to be, and even laboratory monkeys. This is not a food problem, this is an environmental problem. This stuff is everywhere. So we have an environmental thing. Everything in first world countries is getting fatter. And with boys, what happens is environmental estrogens like these, it causes delayed puberty. So when you look in junior highs now, you see girls who are very advanced physically, and the boys are like still little kids. Right, we're starting to see this. It also attributes to ADHD. Uh, it gives obesity problems, but it only happens in boys. For girls, you get opposite factors in a lot of cases. So for plastics, that's something we want to talk about. So what do we do? And I am I'm doing good on time. First off, for your boys, just remember that their brains develop at a different pace. Okay? So if your child, and you're trying to read, and if, if he is finding that frustrating, then just wait. You do not have to start preschool or kindergarten at six. You can start them at seven. In fact, I read one psychologist, he said this, he says, give your boy the gift of an extra year. He says, because it won't make any difference. Because does anybody ask you how old you are at your first job interview? Nobody cares. They don't care when you got out of high school. They don't care if you were 16 or 17 when you were a sophomore, nobody cares at all. But if your boy is not interested in reading and you're doing a school where they have a rigorous kindergarten, it's going to be potentially incredibly frustrating for your son if his parietal gray matter is not ahead of schedule, right? It's probably on schedule. So that's number one for parents. Uh, and then second, just don't let them get put in that dumb group. It's not good for boys. It's not good for girls. Nobody should be in the dumb group. Just keep them home one more year. Start them a year later. It is all advantage no disadvantage to starting kindergarten at six or seven. No difference.
my entire dadhood with kind of wanting to phone it in sometimes because my wife is an amazing woman and an amazing mother. I can abdicate to her and she will pretty much pick up the slack. And I have done that. And I've done that for long periods of time. I don't do it anymore much, but I still fall into it. It's my nature. My nature is to be lazy and to let Cheryl do the hard work, right? Who doesn't want somebody else to do the hard work, right? It's kind of natural. So dads, the, the real question is, are you all in or are you phoning it in? And if you're phoning it in, I just want to encourage you, man, it is gratifying to step up, sacrifice, die to self, pour into your kids and talk about some really hard stuff uh, and to talk with your kids about that uh, and to know that, you know what, I didn't get to watch whatever it was that I've been binge watching on Netflix, but I did get to pour into my kids' heart and their life. And it's, you, you develop a taste for it. Right? It's like um, thinking, oh man, what, Tom Ka. The first time I had Tom Ka, it, it's this Thai soup. I'm like, that is weird. <laughs> I don't know why anybody put coconut and this is not good. But then I had it again. I was like, okay, it is weird, but I can see why people like it. And by the time I had it the third time, I'm like, this is the best soup I have ever had in my life. Right? I develop a taste for it. And it's the same thing with pouring into your kids. And so with ADHD, just beware the quick fix. Honestly, if you have a kid and he's just rambunctious, it is very tempting to put him on meds because he's gonna stop being rambunctious. But that's not good parenting and he probably really doesn't need to be on it. If your child is exhibiting um, ADHD symptoms and that's in your handout, you can look those up. If you see that in all those areas that are on there, you need to get a genuine referral from somebody who's been trained and has the tools and the equipment to do that assessment. And then if they have that assessment, then you can remember that you have the non-stimulant alternatives like Welbutrin and Intruvia, stuff like that. And you can mix or just do the non-stimulant ones. But if you do Adderall and Ritalin, that is a class two narcotic. A class one narcotic is cocaine and heroin. This is one level down. It is a class two narcotic. That's how powerful, these are very powerful drugs. And so if you put your kids on those on high doses for a long time, you are probably going to have some effects and most likely it's gonna be lack of gumption, get up and go. But what they found is that a small dose of that mixed with something like Welbutrin, which doesn't have those side effects, turned out to be just effective and in a lot of cases, the Welbutrin alone was effective, and then you don't have any effects on the nucleus accumbens in any of that part of the brain. So last thing, plastics, just use glass and stainless steel, right? Especially for your boys. So if you got plastic plates and plastic cups, just get rid of them and get stainless steel and get glass. Uh, and are your kids gonna drop and break some? Yep, they will. Uh, but it's, that's a much better price to pay than which uh, the other options. Oh, and those soft vinyl toys for, uh, for babies, you know, that they use for teething, it's like a book, and they can chew on it too. That stuff without the additives to the chemicals is as hard as PVC. They mix these chemicals in, and it's a strong chemical bond, but it is not stronger than a baby that's teething. And so the, you don't want, you want to avoid those toys. Don't let kids teeth on them. Don't microwave in plastic and styrofoam. You guys know that. Right, everybody's heard that. There's good reason, it's real. Uh, and then dentists will use teeth sealants that have phthalates, because it's, it's a plasticized product and it's, it's, super hard, it's a super hardening agent. Uh, and so you wanna ask, if you're gonna do the teeth sealing route, you wanna make sure you don't have those. So if you have questions about any of my facts, here's all my, um, <laughs> here's my references, you can look that up. And uh, Cheryl, I am one minute over, I apologize.